Good morning, this is Steve again from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Welcome. Today is episode three in Circle of Strength, entitled My Big Toe. This is our series focused on celebrating and developing resilience. But first, let's connect with where we've been. Circle of Strength is factors that we as a church have identified as be being helpful in developing strength when we're facing traumatic experiences. In the secular world, this usually comes up in context of discussions of adverse childhood experiences, social determinants of health, toxic stress, things like that. Okay. We're expanding that to talking about resilience as a factor in overcoming sin and the tendencies in our lives to go back to things that we've been trying to overcome. In session two last month, I interviewed my son Eric, who's a practicing Stoic. That was not just a father trying to lure his son to church. Eric volunteered to come because we intentionally wanted to demonstrate something. People with divergent perspectives can have meaningful conversation if they implement certain principles. Building a connection, finding common ground, actively listening to each other, and most importantly, avoiding the techniques of debate that are so prevalent on Facebook and in our society in general. Why did we do this? Because in talking about the circles of strength, we're treading on some touchy subjects, and these principles are going to be invaluable for us going forward. And last week, Pastor Pete was with us, and something he shared was very meaningful to me. You don't have to do this alone. Isolation and loneliness are poison when it comes to developing resilience in our lives and overcoming trauma. So where does this take us? Meet Halakas Stephanos, my big toe. Not pretty. Uh, you can see that he's been a lot of places. Um, those ridges in the toenail there, uh, those are from him bumping up against my shoes, which tells you that my shoes are either too small or they're loose in the middle and so my foot slides forward and it hits the end. But that's not the story. Our hole came with a fireplace and lots of trees. And every year I cut down a couple of trees to try to help with the fuel bills during the winter. Besides, this gives me motivation for exercise and it helps to reaffirm the legitimacy in my membership in the Hubba Hubba Bubba Man's Club. As an added bonus, instead of begging for a mechanical splitter. I uh, use an old-fashioned uh, splitting mall. Now, this little clip is something I prepared for my grandson to educate him on manly behaviors. Okay. Now, notice how the wood, when I hit the wood, how it splits and it just flies off in random directions. Okay. I don't have a lot of control over that other than where I hit the wood. In November of 2018, I uh, was splitting wood. I was late in the season, and uh, I was in a hurry to get things done, and so I was pushing things a bit. Okay. Uh, with my health problems, I can only split wood for 10 or 15 minutes before I start getting shaky and uh, have difficulty hitting the wood in the same spot each time. But I was in a hurry, and so I was pushing things to exhaustion, and one day when I was splitting the wood, instead of it flying off to the side or flying away from me, one of those pieces of wood came rocketing towards me. And you can see, this wood doesn't just float gently through the air. This is like a missile, bam! And it hit me on my left foot, and uh, it hurt. Okay, and being a man, I hopped around on one foot for a little while and shook my foot and uh, <clears throat> yelled, uh, yelled a little bit. Um, but then after I'd shaken it off, I went back to splitting wood despite the pain that I was feeling. And I worked 
off and on the rest of the day uh, trying to get the job done. I'd work for a little bit and then I'd go in and rest and then I'd work a bit. That night when I took off my shoes, I found that at the base of my toenail there was a dark spot. Now medically, what this is called is a subungal hematoma, which is a blood clot or a bruise underneath of the toenail. So the matrix is the living part of this, the toenail. That's the cells that produce the nail. And uh, when you hit it, it breaks blood vessels there. But because you've got the nail on top, the blood can't expand, and so you get a lot of pressure there, and the toe is throbbing. Now, <clears throat> in a serious case, then I would have uh, gone to see a doctor. Uh, he would have taken an x-ray to make sure I hadn't broken the toe, and then he would have used cautery to drill a hole down through the nail to release the pressure. But this didn't seem to be a big spot. It didn't look like a lot of bleeding, and I didn't think, it, I didn't think I'd broken my toe, and I didn't want to take the time to go in to see the doctor. Kind of like the rest of us. Okay? So instead, I called my wife and told her I had a boo-boo and I needed it kissed, as she gently informed me that she didn't kiss my feet. My wife loves me, but she doesn't kiss my feet, and uh, that's probably the way it should be. Six months later, this is what my toe looked like. Six months. Now, for three of those months, Vivian had to be careful around me. Uh, when she kisses me, she kind of has to stand on tiptoe, and when she does that, often our toes overlap. Now, usually that's not a problem, but with this toenail, <clears throat> for the first three months, when she stepped on my toes, I felt it, and I would wince and jerk back, which just spoiled the mood terribly. This is a picture from just a week or so ago, okay? The nail is still growing out. It still hasn't finished healing. So why are we talking about this? These pictures are ugly and the topic is painful. Exactly. Our topic is trauma and resilience. And as my toe recovered from its trauma over the past year, I've been trying to wrap my mind around what it takes for us to adopt a trauma-informed view here in church, in my life, uh, dealing with the things that Christians talk about, sin and salvation, overcoming. Sin damages us, it harms us. And that's, that's the insight that triggered all of this exploration. Sin does physical damage to us. And it goes without reason then that overcoming sin has to involve physical healing as well as this spiritual dimension that we talk about in church. But what does that mean? <clears throat> as I've watched my toe heal, I've seen three elements working together that have changed my perspective on what resilience means. But first, a disclaimer. This is Steve's formulation, okay? The literature on resilience is all over the place. The experts don't agree. There is no consensus. So if what I'm saying is different from the experts, experts, yep, that's right. I'm disagreeing because I'm seeking a path in a confusing world. So this is Steve trying to make a pra uh, find a practical way forward um, so take it for what it's worth, okay? If you find something that's of value, adopt it. But please don't take offense, because that's not my objective. So back to my toe. For healing to occur, the first, the, 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 the first element that was obvious is that protection has to happen. I need to protect my toe. If I keep letting chunks of wood hit that toe, it's ne never going to heal. Okay, and it's going to end up looking uglier than its brother toe on the other foot. Second, healing has to occur. Duh! But I think sometimes we miss that point in life. It's very common today to hear people say, grief never ends. Or, wounded hearts never heal, they just scab over. Or, 
The damage from traumatic experiences never goes away. Well, I kind of reject that picture of reality because it locks us onto the merry-go-round. If healing can never occur, if our hearts and minds and bodies, our lives, can never be restored, then we're always the prisoners of our past. Always. Domestic abuse is a major agenda in the U.S. today. Our government spends lots of money providing shelters and treatment for victims. Not a single state invests money in treating those who have abused. Why? Because we live in this story that once you're an abuser, you're always an abuser. And there's truth to that. The likelihood of a person who has abused one person of abusing another is quite high. But there's a problem with that. The majority of abusers were abused. Abuse begats abuse. And the current help that's provided to people who have been abused has never been shown to change that. So we're, we're, we're still on the merry-go-round. We may be providing symptom control for the people who are abused, but it doesn't appear that we're doing anything to stop the cycle of abuse. We have to find a path to healing. Or we're trapped. I don't like that picture. You can call me a positivist or a, or a hopeful, but I want to find a way forward. Now, the same thing is true in church with every form of sin, okay? A child abuser coming to church, a sexual, a sexual predator coming to church. We operate in the picture, once a sinner, always a sinner. You steal, you lie, think about it in your own life. Do you ever truly forgive someone who's done something that you consider really bad? The third element is confidence. We have to regain confidence. And by, by this I mean we have to become confident of our ability to function in life. If I'm an abused woman, I have to become confident in my ability to have a meaningful relationship with other people and not be abused. Okay. Same is true in, in, in other aspects, okay? We have to become confident of our ability to function in life, and this goes beyond protection, beyond healing, and it's much more than the power of positive thinking. Confidence is not an emotion. It's a state of mind, an attitude, a choice, a behavior, a perspective through which we approach life and live it to its fullest. But it's easy to get stuck here on any one of these levels. Okay? If we become fixated on protection, then we start building walls to protect ourselves. Sometimes that takes the form of phobias, fear that limits our behavior, keeps us out of situations where we feel dangerous or anger and bitterness. Okay. 10 years, 20 years after we experience the abuse, we still have these walls of anger and bitterness that show up any time we talk about the person or anybody we associate with the person. Now, I understand that anger and bitterness and fear are a part of recovery. I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's easy to get stuck here and then this becomes our response to the trauma that we've been through. It becomes our tool for trying to develop resilience. I'm suggesting that if we get stuck here and this is the tool that we're using, there's more to life. Now, if we get stuck on healing, on the other hand, we become victims. Woe is me. Okay? or using, using our past as an, an excuse for our current behavior. I once had a friend 
whose father was killed while they were missionaries in Africa, right in front of him. He was only nine years old, and his father was murdered right in front of him. I knew him when he, we were in college, and he had no emotional stability. But any time that he would explode and somebody would would get after him or get mad at him, he would just crumple into tears and he said, they did this to me, they did this to me, they killed my dad in front of me and that's why I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay? A victim is caught in a cycle of I can't because of the trauma they've gone in. Okay? Now I understand the pain But when we get stuck there, and 10 years later, that's still where we are, there's more to life. We can all also play the sick role. I tried that with my toe, with Vivian. You know, the first time she asked me to take out the trash, I said, oh honey, I can't, my toe hurts too much. That worked one time, okay? The next time I tried that, she said, but I see you walking out to the garage for other things all the time. Just take the trash out. My wife loves me. She didn't let me get stuck there. She assured me that healing was occurring. The confidence level, though, is the hardest. Okay? If we don't feel confident in one area of our lives, it's hard for us to feel confident in other areas. And so we develop this free-floating floating anxiety or depression where we f our self-worth and our meaning, we find no meaning in life, okay? And as a result, we develop avoidant behavior. We, we become risk-adverse, not just in the area where we experience trauma, but in all of life. We, we, we're fearful. We don't want to extend ourselves because we're not confident of our ability to function. These three elements of resilience then become three questions that we need to ask every category in our circle of strength. How does this category, how, did the, how does body care help to provide protection, healing, restore confidence? These are our targets. This is what we seek in order to grow into resilience. Here's an example I stumbled onto this week. Traumatic events in childhood, or toxic stress, even in adults, causes the frontal lobe, the front part of our brain, to shrink or not grow, and also affects the limbic system, the hippocampus specifically, which is involved in emotional control and memory creation. Traumatic events physically change our brains. What I was excited to, to learn this week, I stumbled onto this TED Talk by uh, Wendy Suzuki. It's entitled, The Brain-Changing Benefits of Exercise. She studies brain plasticity, how the brain changes. And in her lab, they've, they documented that regular exercise for six to 12 months causes the frontal lobe to increase and the hippocampus to increase in size. The very effects that are the very parts of the brain that are affected by traumatic events. This is the first time I've heard of anything that gave us hope of healing. How does body care provide healing? This goes much, much further than using drugs to control anxiety or depression. This means that we can actually restore the body and bring it back to normal. We're not trapped or destined to always have a crippled brain. But this begs a question. Is this really church stuff? I mean, it sounds an awful like, lot like what I'm bringing into church is just self-help mumbo-jumbo, right? Well, here are two reasons I don't think that's true. Number one, Luke 4, 18 and 19, you can look it up yourself, okay? Just Google it and it'll, it'll show up. This is Jesus' mission statement. 
This is what he declared. This is what I'm about. This is what I was sent here for. This is my meaning and purpose in life. And what it consists of is that he was sent to pre preach good news, not spiritual good news, preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, deliver captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free the abused. That's not much of what we talk about in church at all, is it? Now, some theologians say, well, he wasn't really talking about the, these things. These were just metaphors for the spiritual things that he was going to be doing. When you read the story of the gospel, you find out that he was doing all of these things. His ministry was very physical. There wasn't a lot of theory. In fact, it frustrates us when we try to say, what did Jesus teach? We have to go to Paul to find the teachings of Christianity because Jesus was so busy doing Christianity. And that's my point. This was Jesus' mission. But when Christians talk about mission, we jump to the Great Commission and preaching, teaching, baptizing. And I'm in full agreement that those are part of our mission. However, when we limit the gospel to that, we're trying to crunch Jesus' mission statement down into something that is manageable. If we address these issues at all, it's as tools to lure people into church, the old rice basket Christianity. I think there's more, that, more to the gospel than that. Second, at the beginning of the series, we spent some time on Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 11 through 18 where Paul talks about us putting on the whole armor of God. Part of that armor is righteousness. Now, some Christians want to limit righteousness to forgiveness. We're forgiven. I think it goes far beyond that. I think he actually wants us to be righteous, to live righteous lives. And right living require, requires overcoming. When you look at the circle of strength, what you find is a definition of righteousness. We're taking care of our bodies, our minds, our spirits, managing stress, taking care of our families, friends, education. All of these things are elements of what right living is. But I think resilience is a major part of what we need to be focused on as Christians. So for the rest of our time here in church, we're going to be applying these principles in a practical discussion of the eight secrets of health, building our explore, on our exploration last month of body care, and I'd like to encourage you to do the same thing at home. Okay? But remember, you don't have to do it alone. Seek out a friend. Share with them. Ask them to share with you. And if you live nearby, you're always welcome to come here and join us. The journey is exciting, and we'd love to share it with you. Thank you, and have a good day. We'll see you next week.